Hello everyone, how are you going? My name is Jane Arneson and I am doing a, uh, a session, a virtual uh, lesson on setting up the mix. And um, I'm really excited to be invited by Suntory to be a part of this. Wish I could be in Nairobi, that would be really good. It's getting quite cold here in Berlin. But I uh, hope that the this video will be really useful for you um, in kind of tr figuring out how to approach the mix, um, an area that maybe a lot of people don't know about or don't think about or talk about. Uh, so uh, let's let's get into it. Um, I'm going to be doing lots of demonstration today, but then I also have uh, some slides to keep us on track. All right. So what am I going to do today? So as I said, it's setting up the mix. And to me, the, the elements that I do before I start mixing is always the same. So I will organize all of the tracks. I will gain stage them. I will listen. And from that listening, we'll make a plan. Uh, I will uh, select reference tracks and import them and set them up. I will apply routing if I think it's necessary and I will set up mix bus processing. Now I do this in this specific order. So the order does matter um, for me and I will explain as I go time, you know, when I think it's appropriate. You'll also note that I have inter an introductory note and a final note. So the introductory note is just um, that step before setting up the mix, which is how do I transition from uh, production into mixing. So that's often a, a bit of a gray area. So I wanted to talk about that first before we talk about the actual setup of the mix. And then at the end, once we've set up the mix, the next question is, okay, what do I do next? How do I, how do I approach the mix? So I wanted to touch on that briefly, um, although obviously it's not within the kind of the plan for this, uh, for this uh, video tutorial. Okay, so that's what we are doing. Let's get into it. So transitioning from production to mixing. The first question is, why can't I just produce while I mix? And the answer to that is, if you want to, go for it. Like you totally can produce whilst, whilst you mix. Um, however, there are some reasons why a lot of people don't actually do that. And so I wanted to talk about those a, a bit. Now, the first thing to say is that mixing and producing are different things. We but we're using the same tools. So for example, when I'm using, you know, a chorus effect in production, I want to hear the sound of the chorus effect because I want to design and change the character of the sound to make it sound cooler or better or more interesting. When I'm going to use chorus in mixing, I want to use chorus when it's undetectable in terms of its character of the chorus, but I'm using chorus to kind of subtly move sounds around and change the relationships of one sound to another. Okay, so it's a different, it's the same uh, effect, the same kind of audio processing, but the way that we're approaching it and the goals are different. So when you produce whilst you mix, sometimes those lines can be blurry. And particularly if you're beginning mixing, it can lead to just not doing a good mix. So maybe if you feel like you're someone who wants to produce whilst you're mixing, that's fine. But maybe you should do some practice, just practicing mixes separately to really learn how to mix first. And then when you feel like you're really good at mixing, then you can bring them back together. That's what I would suggest. Okay. So let's say you've decided, okay, I'm going to mix separate from my production. Then the next question is, Okay, so what do I, how do I get it from the production to the mix? Now, the first thing that's really important when we're mixing is that we don't want any MIDI files and we don't want, um, you know, software instruments and things like that. So any of those things should be rendered to audio. Another thing is that any of the audio processing that you have on that's, you know, created the sounds of the whatever it is that you've made, you want them also to be printed into the file, right? So why do we want to do that? Well, one thing is CPU. If you have all of this stuff that you've created and then you add all the mixing processing, your computer is likely to stop working or have problems. So there's that. It's a practical reason. And the second aspect is, um, is also just for like a clean slate for clarity for, you know, the delineation between production and mixing. 
So all audio files. Then, you know, when you say that, people start to freak out because they're like, oh, I have to make decisions. And it's like, yeah, you do. You have to make decisions at some point. And this is also another thing which is really good about separating production and mixing because it forces you to decide on whatever it is that you set up. And then you focus in the mix on, you know, adjusting and improving, enhancing those things that you've made in production. So when you're trying to decide now what to leave on and what to turn off, I would say the first thing is don't sweat it. Just go with your gut and for most of it, just like leave it on. Now, there are a few things that I would just want to bring out. Um, So if in doubt, leave it on is the main thing. Um, The other thing to say is that you should have your production project on hand at the beginning of the mix so that you can open it up again. If there's been something that you bounced out incorrectly, you can go and get it right? So it shouldn't be a problem. So don't overstress about it and know that you can open it up and, you know, get any files that you're not happy with how you bounce them. So now we've alleviated all of our stress about it, we can kind of think about what we want to do. So in general, if it's sound design, i.e. if you turn the processing off and it sounds completely different, then clearly it has to stay on because that's what you've done you've created this new sound so that definitely stays on now if you want to turn off the mixing stuff the mixing stuff is that when you turn off there's not that much noticeable difference it's just subtle differences Um, so that is you know often compression and eq so if you're not sure about it if you feel like i don't know what i'm doing here i haven't really thought it through and you worry that you might have done it poorly i.e over compressed something then turn it off you know, so if you think, oh, I like the way this sounds, leave it on. Okay, so it's you can hear what I'm saying here. Trust your gut, have a listen, don't overthink it. Uh, the second and thing that I want to bring out is that if you were, when you're doing your production, if you're putting reverbs and delays directly on your tracks, like let's say vocals, and you have the reverb on the actual vocal track, not in a parallel send, right? If you have it directly on the track, it's always a good idea to bounce the vocal wet and the vocal dry. So then you have options and you can decide how you want to work with it. Um, Oftentimes, you know, because we're working with space or virtual space when we're mixing. So oftentimes it's, we find it's better to have the dry one and we can blend in the, uh, the wet one. Um, It just, it just helps the mix and the vocal to kind of sit better. Okay. So they're my tips and uh, just go with your gut on that. Okay. So we've bounced out all our stems and we're ready to go. What do we do? So as I said, the first step one is import and organize. Now this might seem really obvious, uh, but I wanna go through it anyway. Okay, so let's go to uh, Ableton and let's have a look at this. So the first thing that I said is make sure that you check the sample rate and the bit depth. Now this is important and we can figure out the sample rate and the bit depth I'm just going to get a finder window and let's find these files. So we're in here. Right. Okay. So here's my mix setup project. And then I'm going to look into this, the samples. Now I can do command I, I think it's um, right click, get information as well. And I want to find out here what the sample rate is and what the bits per minute are. Um, Okay, so here you can see that it's 44.1 and 24. So I need to then check, make double check that the project that you have is set to the same thing. So I'm going to do command comma or control comma if you're on a PC to get the preferences up and I'm going to have a look at this. So I go into the audio tab and I can see my in out sample rate is 44.1. Perfect. That's good. Now the bit depth is something that people don't really know where it is. So it's actually in the recording tab. I need to go and check and you can see that mine is set to 24. So that's good. My bit depth and my sample rate match the samples that I've brought in. Perfecto. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do is I need to organize everything. Now let's see what we've got here. There's, I've got a bunch of references down the bottom that I'm going to talk about later. And then I have like shakers and some things that are not clear, something called Albino that I don't know what it is. So it's not a very helpful name. So I'm going to go through and organize these. Okay, so I want to do it together because I think that sometimes um, the organization like seem might seem easy, but maybe it isn't. And actually what I want to do now is I would like 
to, I think I'm going to move my, move myself over a bit uh, onto the other side of the screen. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that should be better. Okay. Because uh, I'll be doing things on the right hand side. Okay, cool. All right. So now what are we going to do? So I want my kick to be at the top. And again, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't need to like worry about it too much, but just get things organized in a way that makes sense to you. So I can see there's a lot of vocals here. Vox, vox, vox. So all of those I want to go down to the end. I also notice that there's some, I should speak into the mic. There's some parallel processing that I want to go down. So it says A, B, and C. So I want to do that. Where's the C? Oh, here it is, yeah. Okay, so A, B, and C, it's like distortion, reverb, and delay. Drums, vocal, that's gonna come down. Shaker needs to go up. Um, now what's this? It's called Tom Rim. Let's hear that. Okay, so we hear there's a problem because I can hear that there's the organ in here as well. So I need to mark that as a problem. I've also noticed that there's a bit of a clicking happening and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know why it's happening. So it shouldn't matter too much for us because we're just setting up the mix. So apologies about that. But if you hear it, it's on my end. So we'll just ignore it. So here there's something wrong with this. So the potential is that I'm going to have to go into my project and bounce this out again, the tom rim without the organ in, in it okay because it should just be sounding it should just be sounding like this okay but in the middle it's got an organ in it okay so that's not good um so i've got to make note of that i will rename it tom rim and then i'm going to put an asterisk to say that there's a problem with it okay cool vocals vocals Okay, now synth organ, uh, gladiator, what's that? Let's have a listen to the gladiator. Okay, so I want, now I'm changing this, I'm calling it, it's an arpeggio, arpeggiator, and it's like a melody arpeggiator, so it's the main melody. So that is really helpful for me to, it just gives me more information about what its job is. Synth organ, sounds fine. Uh, hi-hats, so these hi-hats need to go up and I could rename the hi-hats if they've all got different jobs. So, but it's probably fine just at this stage just to leave them be. Uh, what else have we got? Okay, so these ones, are, it just says deep enough. I don't know what it is. So I'm going to solo that. Okay, so that's a top loop, top loop. And that's a drum, so that's got to go up. Maybe I'll put it here. Okay, cool. And then where was the other one? This one. Solo it again. Okay, so that's a top loop with a high pass on it. Top loop, high pass. Great. Okay, and that's also a drum. So it's going to go there. All right. What else? Albino. What's that? Okay, so this is an arpeggiator. Arpeggiator. Arped Okay, so now for the most part things are looking pretty good. This doesn't really look like a shaker though. What's that? What is? Oh, okay, so there's a problem with this one as well. There's the an organ going through it. Okay, so I need to rename that and say problem with an asterisk. Okay, so these two uh, ones that I need to kind of think about. I'm going to turn them off for now and I need to find out if them not being in there is is a problem and then I'd need to bounce them again okay so cool okay and I've got everything else organized now the next thing I want to do is kind of color stuff so I like to have my drums all um like blue I mean it doesn't matter don't worry don't overthink this I'll just do this pretty quickly so hang on I want to select all of them shift right click turn them blue and I also like to do it to all of the files as well so they just it just looks neater for me in my brain bass is brown synth organ art melody arpeggiator i want to make those all the same color they can be pinky ok 
Okay, I'm selecting pinky colors. Now my vocals, I like my vocals to be yellow and there's a few different types of vocals here. So I'm going to color them according to their like job. So they, they're all kinds of shades of yellow. I find this helpful when there's, um, you know, parts that, within the parts that are doing different things. Oh, hang on a sec, let's try that again. All right. Okay, oh, this one's not working, joke. Okay, and then I've got my reverb, um, my reverbs down, like my parallel stuff. So I don't really care about those too much. I make them kind of like pinky, purpley. So cool. And then I have my, now here I've got my reference mixes, so which I'm gonna talk about later. I've got my pre-mix, so I'm gonna call that demo or something, demo mix, and then I have two references. Um, and I'll talk about those when I get into the reference section later. All right, um, so we're pretty much organized. Now let's check in with our notes and see what else needs to be done. So yes, organized tracks, color code, name correctly. Boom, okay, we're good to go. So let's move on to the next bit. Now the next bit is to gain stage. Actually, maybe I can move my self away. So gain staging is, um, is, is re very important. It's an aspect of the, it's an aspect of mix setup that a lot of people don't understand and therefore they're kind of scared to do it. I'm going to go big in this for a second. So they, they don't understand it. They're kind of scared to do it and therefore they do it badly, you know, or don't do it at all. So let's first of all say like, what is gain staging? The gain staging is adjusting the levels of the tracks individually so that they, they don't clip individually. And then really importantly, that the sum of all the tracks in the master doesn't clip. And not only does it not clip, but you have headroom. So the next question is, what is headroom? So headroom is the space between the loudest part of the sound, the loudest transient, and the maximum amount of signal that the system can hold. So in the door, in a digital context, that maximum is zero dB. Okay, so this is like the loudest. If it gets louder than zero, it clips and it gets red in the meters and it doesn't sound nice. Okay, so we want to have headroom. We leave space so that, I don't know, it's just like if you imagine room to breathe, it's, it helps your mix breathe better. It's also useful for the mastering process that you have headroom, you have a place to go when you're doing mastering tasks. So we leave headroom. So then the question is how much headroom do I need to leave? And, you know, there's it can change based on genre and there's different, you know, a few different uh, ideas. However, you need some clear information because you're beginner mixes. So the guideline I would give you is between minor, well, let's say minus 6 dB peak. Okay. So let's have a look. We'll go back into the door and let's have a look uh, here into our meters. Now here, the meter on the right hand side, and I'm going to make these bigger because I'm in mix mode. Um, this is good in, if you make them bigger in mix mode because you can see the levels better. Um, is that I want it to be, I want it not to be going any higher than this like minus six point. Easy, no problemo, okay? So let's have a listen to our mix and have a look at the meters and see what's going on. So it's kind of looking okay in the sense that there's nothing clipping on the individual track. So that's a good start. However, you can see here we are almost clipping. And in fact, I feel like when it gets later on, it's likely that there's going to be clipping. Okay, so you can see here that actually when I bring those other tracks in, it actually does clip, but I think that's because we've got a double up of the organ. But at any rate, it's too loud and we don't have any headroom. So it's not actually clipping, which is good to, he good to hear, but it's not great because 
it's we don't have any headroom. Okay, so how to gain stage. Now gain staging, I'm just going to select all of these and I'm going to make them a bit short, smaller so we can fit them on into, and also that as well. Make them smaller, oops. Okay, also bring this. Let's see if we can get the whole mix into one view, almost. I just like to have this because it helps me, well, it's maybe too small. Okay, whatever. We almost got it in. All right. So what I'm looking at these, I want to think about the different approaches. So um, there's a few ways to go about it. So let's start with the first one. Now, something that I know needs to be so gain staging, you turn things either down or up. So for first off, I want to turn the vocals up because these are too quiet. So this is this part here. You can see right. So one way we can do that is we double click on the, uh, on the file and we get into the detail view and then I can gain it up here. So I'm gonna put that up like about three dB. Now again, with this, just don't overthink it. Just put it up a few dB and see how you go. See how, if it works and it feels more balanced. So, uh, yeah. So that's good, yeah, so I like that. And I'm gonna do the same thing to all of these vocals because I want them to be balanced with each other. So I sent that up three dB. So I'm gonna send these all up. 3db. I can select them all at the same time and then I can put them up 3db. Okay, see I'm not like being exact, I'm just getting them like basically right. Great, okay, I'm happy with that. Um, now, the other thing that I might want to do is I might want to approach it by working in the with a plugin. So this way we go into audio effects and then we go to utilities and we get the utility plugin. And let's say, for example, I think the bass needs to be um, a little louder. So I'm going to bring the bass up, put it when it's playing. Just helps the bass to kind of come through. I wasn't hearing it properly. So that feels better. So I just wanted to show you here the two ways you can gain stage. One is by using the utility plugin. The other is to uh, make the gain up or down in the gain, but the gain fader in the detail view of the clip. Now you'll notice that I've been turning things up. And what I said before was that we have a problem with the headroom. So let's see. Uh, why I didn't do that. So the reason in Ableton, we're just going to select everything. You can see here that the faders are all up at zero. So for me, this is not um, a good way to start a mix because if I need to turn something up, it hasn't got anywhere to go. So in this case, I can bring everything down, all my faders down, and then it's going to give me some nice headroom going into my master. Now, if things were clipping on my individual channels, bringing down the faders doesn't stop clipping on the input. So you would need to gain stage it in the ways that I just showed you. But if everything is on, on the individual levels here, there's no clipping happening. There's just some clipping happening in the master. In Ableton, you can just pull those faders down and that's that's enough. It's a nice, fast, easy way to do it. So let's check out our level now of our master and hopefully we've got some good headroom. Let's check it. Yeah. Okay. Probably pulled it down a little too much. Okay. So I said I wanted it to be no louder than like minus 6 dB. This is kind of the, it's at sitting at about minus eight at the moment. That's okay. There's no problem. Um, I think I want to copy across the gain. I gained up the bass and I want to gain up the kick in the same way. So I copied that plugin from the bass over to the kick. Because I think, you know, this is a house track and the kick has got to be really loud. So I'm just getting that those balances set up uh, in the gain stage as well. Okay, so that's basically, that, that's gain staging. Uh, we're just kind of getting the levels right, making sure we have some headroom and there's a few ways you can approach it. Cool. Okay, so moving on, listen and play. So I'm not going to obviously listen to the whole song now because that's not very interesting for you to sit and watch, but I do want to talk about it. So when, now this to me is the most important part of setting up a mix and it's the part that absolutely no one does on a, like consciously. So it's the, the moment I'm going to listen to the song from beginning to end. 
I not only listen to it from beginning to end, but it's the way that I'm going to listen to it. If this is your track, you've heard it a million times before. So it's very important that you listen in the right way. So we're listening with a critical ear and we're really focused and we want to, we're listening for certain things. Okay. So, and you might not have listened for these things before because you've not been in the mixing phase you've been in the production phase or whatever right so it's a different mindset that we're setting up into the mix so what are we listening for and how are we listening so there's a few things that I've that I've outlined here that I want to talk about so listening to us to excuse me to figure out if there are any problems that's the first thing so problem solving so other is there anything that sticks out that doesn't that doesn't sound like that doesn't sound nice. Okay. So that could be problems with tuning. Maybe there's timing issues. If you're working particularly with live, um, you know, performers or live instruments, timing stuff that might need to be sorted out. Maybe there's things with dynamics. One sound might be super, super compressed or overdriven. If it's a guitar, something else might be really quiet. So thinking about the, the diff problematic relationships between dynamics, Maybe you notice that the arrangement is kind of clashing and there might be some actually some problems in the arrangement where um, the, that you might need to try and figure out in a crafty way through using EQ uh, in the mix. Maybe there are some weird things, a transients and sibilance. This happens particularly with vocals and particularly with vocals that are recorded on kind of lower quality microphones. So if you're hearing things like this, that's stuff that you're going to need to fix in the mix. Um, stuff like that. Is there low end muddiness? Is there, does the mix sound dull? Just a general feeling about if there are problems that you might need to fix. So that's the first thing. Now, of course, if we just approach a mix thinking about problems that need to be fixed, we're probably going to do a bad mix because we're not thinking about the, the, you know, the main thing about what's exciting about the mix and focusing on the positive aspect. Um, if you just think about problems, you might mix the track into the ground and you might take away, strip out all of its goodness by trying to fix everything and kill the energy of the mix. Okay. So you've got to keep that in mind. So the second thing we're listening to when, when we listen to the song is like trying to get a sense of what the song is all about. And, you know, maybe you thought you knew because you produced it, but maybe you haven't, kind of tuned in in this way before so you might be surprised about what you find out um, you know if it's a pop song if the vocals are leading it might be emotional it might be that actually there's a very emotional context that you need to remember and you need to you know like serve that and make sure that you're working to that in the mix if it's a dance track it's obviously going to be groove based and beat based and you've got to really make sure that is this beat like making me want to get up and dance if it's not you've got to keep on working and, and really focus on you with your mix tools how to help that to happen um, so you kind of get what I'm saying here okay so trying to really getting clear about what the goal of the song is um, the second thing to this is for you to find out like what are the heroes or what are the best bits of the song? Are there parts of the song that get you excited? So like sometimes it's a line, it might be a melody part, it could be a lyric, it could be like the sound of the kick drum, it could be a certain, you know, melodic part or you know, it can be anything, but there's got to be stuff in the mix that is really cool that when you hear it, you're like, oh yeah. And if there's not that in the mix, if you're not excited by the, by the song or the production, you shouldn't be mixing it, particularly if it's not your own work. If it is your work and you're not excited by it, maybe you're burnt out because you've been working too much, in which case leave it off for a while until you get excited again. But also if you think that it's not there, you might, at this point you might be like, oh, no, there's nothing that's really jumping out at me that's exciting, then maybe it means that it's not ready to produce, uh, the production isn't finished and you need to go back into production before you start mixing. Okay, so really trying to get a sense about what's going on. So that's your listening and planning. And once you've done that, when you listen through, listening critically, and I would really suggest actually making physical notes because these are the things you can go back to. This is what you heard the first time when your ears were fresh and you were really high attention. This is your reference point when you're mixing. Do, have I done all these things that I said needed to be done? Am I remembering the energy of the song? Am I remembering, are those heroes feeling really, really good? Okay, so it keeps you honest and keeps you on track because it's really easy just to go down and <laughs> to get lost in the mix and just compress everything. And the question is, why are you doing that? Okay, so we need to know why we're doing things. Right, okay, so we've listened, we've planned, we've made our notes. What's next? 
Actually, I wanted to just to bring one thing out, okay? Before we do that, I wanted to talk about what I think are the heroes in this mix. So let's see. So for me, I love the bass line. So let's have a listen to this. Cool. And the other thing that I really love is the ARP melody. Sorry about those dropouts. Okay, so these two things together, what the bass is like really groovy. The art melody is kind of, there's an emotional kind of melancholy aspect to it. So these two things, like I think are I love them when I hear them and I get me excited. So that's just an example about what I mean when I'm talking about the heroes of the mix. All right, so we've done that. Now it's time to set up a reference track. Sorry about that, it's a little bit unclear. I cut that off, but you get what I'm saying. So we're gonna set up the reference track. So I just wanted to start off by saying, okay, what are reference tracks? Why do we use them? Um, and I wanna make a case for it. So reference tracks is a track that you are trying to, you're using as your barometer or trying to make your mix as good as basically. So. It's often, or maybe it's your, it helps you with the aesthetic approach or the style that you're taking in the mix. So for a lot of mix engineers, we're working with clients who have an idea about what they want the song to sound like, which is often inspired by their favorite pieces of music. So it's helpful as a mix engineer to check in with that and to have those references to make sure that we're delivering what it is that the client asked for. Now, if you are mixing your own work, you obviously know you probably think you know what you want it to be at the end of the day, but maybe you don't actually, right? So that's something that I think is really interesting to take a minute and really think, where do I want this to end up? What are the inspirations? What sounds, you know, am I, am I going for? So picking a reference track will help you figure out what it is that you actually, you know, where's your production, where's the, the inspiration track. And that shows you how much distance you have to travel in the mix, like what work you have cut out for you. Um, the other, there's other two points that I want to make, which is really important. Now, reference tracks are used for that. But the other thing is if you're new to mixing, you probably don't have the like critical ears developed yet because you're you know, only just starting to be able to really know when your decisions are correct. So you might do your mix for four hours or eight hours or something and you think, yeah, it's amazing. And then you go and play it for the first time in eight hours next to one of your favorite tracks by whoever artist that you love. And you're like, oh my God, my mix sounds terrible. So the, th the question is like, why? And that's because your, your critical listening is not developed yet and you're probably making wrong decisions. So the reference track keeps you honest. You check in and you're like, oh, I thought that was good, but I've put way too much 200 hertz in on the bass and now it sounds muddy, right? Things like that. Now, the final thing is that even if you are, you go, I'm really good, I've got great ears, but maybe you're not working in a professional mixing room. I mean, a lot of us don't because they, you know, cost hundreds of thousands to set up. It's expensive, right? So, or maybe not hundreds, but like certainly tens of thousands of euros and it's expensive, okay? So then references become really important for us to be able to offset the problems with untreated rooms. If you can hear the mix in the untreated room, then you can set your, uh, hear the reference track in the untreated room. You can set your mix up based on how the reference track sounds in the room and that helps you work with the problems in the room. Maybe it's headphones, you're mixing in headphones or you know cheap monitors as well. So those things can all have an impact, okay? So that's why we use reference tracks. Now, I'm going to demonstrate to you how to set up a reference track and how Ableton is quite cool actually for working with reference tracks. Okay, so back in Ableton and I have down the bottom here and I'm gonna color them all red so that they're important, kind of ready colors. Color them red and this, I've got demo and then I've got two tracks. So I actually wanna group these. I'm gonna call them references. And then let's go to the other view and we can see that they're there, okay. So what I want to do is there's two things that we wanna think about at this point. 
first one is that I don't want the audio for my reference tracks to go into the master because later I'm going to put on some mix bus processing, which we're going to talk about as the last step in the setup. So I can go here, audio two, instead of going to master, I can get it to go straight out the external outs, which is the same thing that's happening on the master. So I bypass that master um, group, let's say. Okay. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that I need to get the level of these balanced. So these are, if we go back in, these tracks down here are mastered. So they're like loud. So I probably want to bring them down so that they're not as loud. And this is my premix, which isn't as, yeah, it's not too bad. Okay. So I'm checking those levels. Then the final thing is we want to be able to go between, um, I want to be able to do a really quick change between the reference and then my mix. So we're going to hit the solo button. I'm going to select one of the mixes that the one of the reference tracks that is going to be my main reference. Okay, so I've just got one selected and then I can toggle between the two. So let's try this out. Okay, so now I've got my reference, which is... Okay, cool. And I turn it off. Okay, but when I turned it off, you can hear that they were both in together. So I need to make sure that the reference is turned off and it will only go on when I hit the solo button. So let's have a listen. So here's my mix. Here's my reference track. Now you can hear that that's too loud. So I want to balance it. So I'm going to A, B. Okay, that feels... Feels pretty balanced now. Okay, now why do they need to be balanced? Because our brain discriminates if something's louder we just think it sounds better so that's why you need to get the levels right okay so now I can just hit the with the mouse the s button or I can go even one step further I can hit the key command button and I can set up something on my keyboard so I just have to hit one switch so I'm going to go I don't know s for solo okay now when I hit s it's going to solo toggle between that Okay, so it's really helpful when you're mixing to be able to go chung chung between reference and mix and help your ears make a quick decision about what's different in the in the track. Great. Okay, so that's we've set up our reference and we are ready to go. What's up next? Okay, so then the step five is to do routing based on the plan um, that we have. So the routing, maybe you don't want to do any routing. Maybe the plan you didn't kind of think about doing any routing don't do it. You don't, you absolutely don't have to do any more routing. Also, what do I mean by routing? It's like organizing the way that the signal flows. So I've got all these individual tracks at the moment and they're all going to the master output. And I can demonstrate that here. Okay. We can see all of these here are all set to go to the master and then the master sends it out the sound card, which is how we're hearing it. But oftentimes in mixing, we might, it might be part of the mix, the plan or the approach of the mix to group certain tracks together. Now you can group tracks together just for organization, but you can also group tracks together to combine their signal flow and then do some processing to them. So for example, in this track, I want to group all my drums together do command G because I want to put some compression on all of those drums so that they feel cohesive and like one uh, you know drum kit uh, if you if you get what I'm saying so I'm going to say drums and then the other area in this where I wanted to group is the vocals but just these part of the vocals because they're like it's like a four-part harmony so I'm going to come on G that and say box okay great so that is my routing and in Ableton, it's really easy. Just select the tracks you want and then do Command G on a Mac or Control G on a PC. So that's our routing. Now, as I said, if you you know if you don't think you know what to do with routing, you don't need to do it. Don't do it. Only if you have a specific idea, as I had here, that I, there's some sounds that I want to make sure that they feel really connected and cohesive, then we would do that. Great. Um. One final point here is that I say the last point down here, it says don't do your routing before you've gained staged. Now, this is important. So if you do routing, 
uh, after you've gained, uh, saying, hang on, if you do writing before you've gained staged, it just is awkward and the gain stage isn't as, doesn't flow as well and things can get uh, problematic and you don't know where you should turn things down and stuff. So I always think it's better just to do the gain stage right at the beginning with just the audio, get the levels right, and then when you throw the signals around and everything when you're routing, you know you ground. Okay. All right, we're almost at the end. We've got one more thing to do, and that is to set up your mix bus processing. So with the mix bus processing, the first thing is to explain what is mix bus processing. So it is just, it very simply put, the mix bus is in Ableton is the master out, the main master uh, channel. Um, perhaps I need to move my... Uh, yeah, I'll move this over here. So one second. Okay. I'm just going to move my face because I think I'm covering up things in Ableton. So yeah. Okay. So it's this master, cha master channel here. Okay. So everything is going to the master. So this is our mix bus. So quite often the technique is to put some processing on this master channel, which is commonly co known in the industry as mix bus processing. Okay, so mix bus. So what do we, what kinds of processing do we put on the mix bus? Well, that depends, depends on the genre, depends on the mix engineer. Um, if you haven't used it before, you don't have to, just carry on your mix without doing mix bus processing. If you're interested in doing it, you can do a bit of research and you can find out more about it. But I will give you a brief introduction to what the kind of beginner approach to mix bus processing is. So compression is the most basic thing. So to put a glue type compressor, which as you, as it sounds like, glues the sounds together. So that's why we use the compressor on the mix bus. Um, and it's a VCA compressor and in Ableton, it looks like this. It is uh, called, finally enough, glue compressor. Okay, so we throw that on. And then the other thing that you might wanna do, now this is kind of getting a little bit more um, advanced maybe, is that sometimes people like to use an EQ that's got a special character or flavor. So the Ableton EQs and stuff like are just pretty standard. They don't really have like a color or a flavor. They're just clean, which is good. But for a mix bus, I would tend to use something a little bit more exciting and fancy. So if you've got any extra non Ableton plugins, this is plug in EQs this is where you'd go so I'm going to pick one um, I really like this I love uh, I like mixing on on the analog SSL desk so I just pick this one because I like the sound of it okay so this would be my mix bus processing for this mix and uh, I've got my EQ after my compressor on purpose so you can decide the organization that you want um, but this is the way I want it to be and I'm going to set them up. So first of all, I like to use soft clipping. It's kind of analogy vibes. I'm an analog chick, so I like that. Now the standard way to set up the mix bus uh, compressor is to have a low ratio of two to one. Can you see that? It's just kind of in the corner. I'm sorry, the corner of it is slightly cut off, but um, okay, so two to one. Then we're going to have a fast release which will kind of tune based on the track. Or if you're not sure, you can always go on A for auto release. And then we're going to have a slow attack. So the idea is that the compression lets the transient parts through and just does some gentle kind of bringing together the, so the, the sounds, uh, the body of the sounds in, in the mix. Okay, and then the final thing with the EQ is that let's say quite often we might want a little bit more energy up in the top end. So we might put a bit of a push there. So I've done like 2 dB up at 16K. And then oftentimes there's muddiness in the low mids. So maybe you want to just like take a little bit out um, in the master. And another thing is that maybe we want to beef it up in that low range and tighten up those lows lower than 20 hertz because we can't hear anything below there anyway. Okay, so let's have a listen to this processing. I'll play the track and then we will, uh, hang on a sec, we will go back. Yeah. So let's check this out, turn it off. I need to get this compressor working a bit more. Okay, 
Okay, so it's kind of subtle. Maybe you can hear it, maybe you can't, but this is the idea. Now, the really important thing, just a final thing to say about this is that this should be set up before you start the mix. So if you put a compressor and EQ on at the end of your mix, that is not mix bus compression or mix bus processing. So the idea is that you set these things up, you set them up now, and then you mix into the compressor and the EQ from the beginning. The reason is, is that you, it impacts the decisions that you make. Um, and if you put EQ and compression on at the end of your mix, well, that's going to mess with the balances and the timbre, the co tone color of the stuff that you've just mixed. Okay. So that is mix bus uh, processing. And that's why we do it in the setup phase because we do it before we actually get into the meat of the mix. All right. So we're almost at the end. Um, the final thing that I just wanted to talk about, now I'm gonna move my, move my face again back down to the bottom corner. And I just wanna finish up with, uh, you know, what, okay, you've got your mix set up and you're ready to go. Then people are like, oh gosh, well, what, what next? So I just wanted to leave you with, um, you know, what, how, how to get going in the mix at the end. So there's three common approaches to mixing generally. It's called bottom up, top down, or like listen and respond is what I'm calling it. So listen and respond is something that is probably more advanced and people that really trust their ears and are working in environments that are really, really trustworthy. That's something that you can, you can go for. for. For most of you, when you're kind of starting up, the bottom up is the most common and particularly for any track that has got um, lots of drums and groove and a lot of low end, which is like 90% of the music that's, that's made at the moment. So bottom up is a good idea. And what does that mean? Is that you start with the foundation elements, which generally is going to be like the drums. So you start with the kick and then maybe you add the bass and then you add the other drums. You, so you're kind of building things up. You start with the kick and get it really good and then build things into it and build it up the whole mix from that. So if you have lots of vocals and the vocals are the most important thing, sometimes if you do the bottom up approach, you end up with vocals on top that don't match. You've kind of not thought about the vocals. So the other way, particularly for vocal heavy mu music, as I said, pop music, stuff like that, you might want to actually start with the vocals. So you get the vocals set up and organized. And then once they're really good, then you start to build all the pieces around it, which is generally kind of going from the top down. Okay, so they're the different ways. Now you can decide which approach is appropriate for you based on the, uh, the, the genre or the track that you're working with. You've got your notes that you, when you went through and you listened, you set up your reference, you're ready to go. So all that is left to do is mix. So enjoy the process. Uh, and that's the most important thing is that make sure you're enjoying it um, because I think these these energies translate. Um, and, you know, also in that point, remember to take regular breaks. It helps your ears and also helps your brain uh, tune in and fix all those things rather than getting lazy. So that's it for today. Uh, and I hope this has been good for you and giving you lots of ideas about how you can, uh, you know, move away from production and into the fin finishing and finalizing stages of mixing. And then you can uh, set up your mix properly to give you all the best uh, chance for doing a really good mix and making a killer track. So that's it from me. I'm Jane Arneson again, and um, hope to you know hope to uh, be delivering a few more of these videos over the course of your studies. Take it easy. See you later.